this paper on um, the terms of reference or the draft terms of reference for the next course steering group. Councillors will recall um, that the request to establish a steering group was made um, once the consent was lodged. Now that we've got the lodged consent in place, we're happy to bring this paper to you and we can take some questions. Thank you. So, Mike, um, I'll kick it off. So we're looking at um, uh, endorsing uh, these terms of reference to to go to the wider group to then um, get some approval from the wider group, which includes our EWE partners. Is that is that is that right? Yes, that's that's right. OK. And uh, the membership, we've had responses from on page 34, 2.5. We've had responses from all those potential partners of, of the representatives? Um, not yet. Um, Your Worship, we haven't reached out to those groups yet. We was going to come through the chambers first and then we'll reach out to, right. to all those um, stakeholders. Okay. Great. Uh, Councillor Barrett. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thanks, um, Mike and Anna, for the paper. A couple of questions. Um, one is it looks like the group ends at the point at which consent is granted. Um, just wondering the rationale behind ending it then versus ending it when we cut a ribbon on a new plant. <laughs> um, well, the rationale behind that was that in the AEE, which was presented as part of the consent conditions, um, a new um, adaptive management steering group will be established um, at that point uh, once a consent's lodged. This the steering group will take us up to the to the consent being lodged. To the consent being granted. Oh, sorry, my apologies. Yeah. Granted. Yep. Yeah. Um, thanks. I won't follow up that one any further. Um, just interested around um, Tamano to why as well in terms of um, quite a bit in that in terms of where Horizons has gotten to already. What awareness do we have around Horizons? Kind of work plan and time frames there and how it potentially impacts or interfaces with this. Kia Kato. Um, we met with Horizons yesterday and they were talking about the updates to their plan, which they need to do as part of incorporating um, provisions into their freshwater standards. Um, my understanding is, is that they're looking at uh, notifying that next year. Um, we had a brief discussion about how that would be incorporated or how it would impact our consent application. Don't want to go too much down a track of how we do that in a planning sense of things, but um, depending on how far through that plan change is, we will have to start addressing it, but it's it's given a waiting in an RMA context. So if those provisions are further down the track, can we get to a hearing or um, we may need to address it, but if they're still at the very light end of it and in terms of how far processed they are, then we will need to consider them. So that's a, um, something we will need to take into account. It really just depends on how far they're through their, their change and how far we are through our consenting process. Both of, both of those timelines being more in Horizons control than ours? Yes. Great. Um, thank you, Mr Chair. Councillor Johnson. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Um, thanks, Mike and um, Just a question around the terms of reference of the steering group. Um, so in 3.3, page 39 of our agenda, um, it says uh, that um, purpose of the steering group, blah, blah, to provide updates to council on the progress of the consent application. So does that mean that council will be receiving a progress report regularly from the steering group? I think that's my understanding, yes. So do you know how often that would be and, and how would it be presented in a meeting? You know, like a council meeting like we've got today or? <laughs> yeah, my my, um, my understanding is that we bring a quarterly report. Quarterly? Yep. Yeah. OK, so so probably you'd be presenting it on behalf of the steering group, would you? I, I suppose that's yeah. up to you, council, to decide, yeah. OK, thank you. <laughs> it's a yes, uh, Mike. Um, all right. Uh, thank you. That's the questions gone. Thanks very much, Anna. Thank you, Michael. So we've got uh, recommendations to council. The council endorsed the uh, the, the draft uh, terms of reference for Nature Call Steering Group Attachment One. 
the council agrees uh, with the mayor's recommendation to appoint Mayor Councillor Barrett, Councillor Denison, Councillors Bellin as elected member representatives on the steering group. I'm happy to move that. Um, seconded by the Deputy Mayor. Um, thanks, uh, Mike and, and Anna, for the work to date. And uh, it will be um, a very uh, interesting uh, membership group there between um, iwi, uh, environmental groups, uh, some government departments, uh, 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 agricultural sector and, and trade trade uh, industry. So um, it's certainly going to be um, a, a decent conversation and uh, one that is um, that is needed to move the project along. So um, I hope you'll approve um, or support the recommendations. Being no other commentary, we'll vote please. And it's passed 14 votes for and none against. All right, thank you. We'll move along to number 14, which is around um, definition of conflicts of interest. And I'll ask our legal counsel, Desiree Harvey, to speak to that, please. Page 25 of your council papers, please. Kia ora koutou. <clears throat> Mr. Mayor, councillors, excuse me. Um, this report, which you've waited for for a wee while, um, is in response to a question around um, some providing some clarity on uh, the difference in application of where a member declares an interest versus a conflict of interest and how that affects your decision making. Uh, we're not recommending any changes to the standing orders. Um, that is because the LGNZ model standing orders don't um, differ from what we actually have. A few of the other councils that we surveyed um, also have similar, well, the same um, provisions in their standing orders. And uh, that these are set out in table one and the report there for you for a bit of clarity. Um, the important principle to take away from this is that it is really for members to identify um, declare, assess and um, manage their own conflicts of interest. Um, the point that we'd like to make also is that the Chief Executive is available for a conversation around that if um, there is some clarity to be provided, they're highly um, factually dependent and um, can vary in, in degree. Um, hopefully the report provides some guidance to facilitate that um, and I I don't believe that I've mentioned in the report, but the Code of Conduct has also got quite a big section on this also. So happy to take questions. Thank you, Desiree. Uh, Councillor Barn. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Thanks, Desiree, for the report. Um, I had a question about the um, appendix from the Aud Auditor General, where there's a category in there about conflict of roles, which wasn't something I'd really um, seen considered in our documentation before and I'm um, not so much concerned about situations where elected members are appointed to external bodies because I think you're wearing the same hat at that point yep. but thinking about where councillors are in their personal capacity have different roles um, and that that risk being managed and it says in the guidance that you should discuss with both entities Mm -hmm. um, as to how mm -hmm. you might manage that conflict. And I wondered how you saw that happening. What is the entity that elected members would discuss with how they manage that conflict of roles? Well, I, from our perspective, we've actually incorporated the non-financial and the conflict of roles together there so they can actually be considered in that same um, area. And, and the possibility of when a conflict might arise is when there is an overlap. Um, in your responsibilities to each individual um, yes. group uh, or organisation. So if you were wanting to have that conversation, it would have to be with presumably the chief executive in the first instance, and then perhaps um, I might suggest the mayor. Okay. Um, and is that something 
that officers would be proactive in, say, when we do our declaration of interests every year? Is that something that officers review to see if there's potential for conflict there that the individuals might not have picked up? The guiding principle is that it is for uh, members themselves and that the fact um, that's because of the fact that you know your involvement in things better than we do. You know, we have your your statements and your declarations under the Lame Year and under um, the Pecuniary Interests Amendment Act. Um, and, you know, we have a published summary of those on the website. We potentially would discuss something with you. We would raise it with you if we thought it was an issue. Um, because we're all here for the same thing to you know promote good decision making um, but that would only be if we were if we knew about it so we can't do that uh, we can't be expected to do that and you you wouldn't expect us to do that either for interests that we don't know about um, but ultimately the responsibility rests with the elected member to to raise to declare and to manage okay so final question and I think you do cover this in the report but just for clarity what is the risk if elected members don't declare an interest or a conflict of interest or a conflict of roles? It depends on the situation. Um, there are a range, you know, we open ourselves up to a judicial review. Um, there are some personal um, liabilities there if you have breached the Lamia rules um, that attach to you personally. Um, reputationally, it's not a good look um, and we're, we're breaching a lot of laws, in, including the LGA, which is to promote open and accountable and transparent decision making. Thanks, Desiree. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Councillor Johnson. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Thanks, Desiree. Um, just in your table one on uh, page 27, um, we've sort of got some questions and some of it's green and some of it's red. Um, for interest in an item, mm -hmm. um, I've noticed that elected members often say at the start of the meeting, oh, I've got an interest in item 15 or whatever, but it's not a conflict. Mm -hmm. So what's the value of saying that? I mean, because does that really category exist in the law? I, I, I don't understand that that declaration and what the purpose of it is. From my perspective, if, if a decision was challenged, your conduct at the time that you are making the decision is what is looked at. So, and I, I wouldn't want to be giving us any, you know, hard and fast statements to make. It would depend on the context, but the fact of you having an open mind and, and being able to show that when you're making a decision is what I would glean from the fact that you've considered whether or not it is a conflicting interest and you've decided that it is an interest. So, if you were to come to me and and have that conversation, or Wade, sorry, um, the chief executive, um, our advice would likely be that you would make a statement to that effect, which was how you felt at the time that you were making the decision. Okay, so it signals that you've considered whether or not there might be a conflict and you've decided that there isn't. Yes. And in that sense, it's still useful. It absolutely is useful. Okay, cool. Thank you. So, um, I'm interested in, I guess, if you hold office in an organisation, um, so there's no personal benefit to you, no pecuniary benefit or whatever, but there might be a perception of bias from the outside. Mm. Um, how, you know, what would be your advice on managing that potential conflict of interest, I guess? From the case law, and there's a few around over the last few years, the test that you would be asking yourself is would a fair-minded observer consider that me as the decision maker can have an impartial mind in that circumstance, keeping and well, understanding the facts of the situation. And that can be quite difficult to um, decide or to consider. And we we can help with that contemplation. But that is the legal test that's been set and come through from a lot of cases in the last few years in particular. Um, so it brings an objective kind of reasonable standard to it. What would a, a, a reasonable member of the public think? Would they think that I can bring an impartial mind to the, making this decision 
knowing all of the information that I have about this potential conflict. Mm. And um, there's no, basically no checks and balances. It's the individual member's decision. So, um, you know, if, uh, I don't know, Councillor Wood thinks that um, I have a conflict and I think I don't, then it's down to me. It is down to you. Um, the standing orders also state that it is not for the meeting or the chair to decide whether a member has a conflicting interest. So it is it's very subjective in that sense, but with an objective element, I guess, to it. Mm -hmm. OK, thank you. Councillor Naylor. Thank you. A um, couple of questions from me. One was quite similar to what Councillor Johnson asked in terms of the definition of an interest, because mm -hmm. um, is it defined in legislation anywhere? I mean, because I've, I've seen a lot of um, commentary about a conflict of interest mm. in legislation, but the interest I haven't seen. I don't think it's defined in legislation. Um, there is some commentary around trying to define it in the OAG's advice, but it is, without trying to use the actual word itself, it's, it's a role or involvement or relationship or duty that you might owe to an individual or an organisation that overlaps with your role in this example at council. So is there any treatment in the in the descriptions that are included here and, and elsewhere that I've seen, whenever there is an interest, it's the assumption or the way it's written is that that is a conflict of interest. Is that, am I understanding that correctly? I, I guess what I'm trying to understand is this differential between a conflict of interest and an interest. I thought if there was an interest, then you'd declare it as a conflict, but is that not? No, an interest doesn't necessarily become a conflict unless there is an issue. And the questions that we've set out in here help you determine whether or not it is a conflicting interest. Local government is treated in a slightly different way to um, the judiciary, for example, and ministers making decisions as well. Um, you're, intent, you're, you're supposed to be involved in the community here. You're, you're, you're valuable because you do that and because you have all of these interests and, and all of these relationships. But you do need to be mindful that, it, that there is a point that it might be able to be perceived that that relationship is going to conflict with your responsibilities to both organisations. Okay, thank you. And just my second question relates to that table one on page 27 as well, where it's got um, the can a member be present in the room and it's yes um, for part one and no for part two. Um, do you have a view, it says the member should withdraw themselves from the table in part one. Yep. Do you have a view or is there any guidance around removing yourself from the table with in part one, whether that should be um, that you can stay in the room or whether you should be out of the room. Is there any guidance on that? No guidance, um, just the model standing orders that come from LGNZ, which is what we have incorporated. Um, the fact that it says should withdraw themselves doesn't mean that they must. Um, and my observation is that where there has been a conflict declared and somebody has removed themselves from the table, they've generally removed themselves from the room. Um, so it comes down to the way that you want to behave. But the standing orders state that you, the members should remove themselves from the table, but they are not allowed to participate in any of the decision making or questioning. All questions, did you say? Oh, you mean asking yeah. questions? Yeah. So we're just talking about um, whether or not they must remove themselves, and it, it, it clearly states that they should. There's no no requirement. Okay, sorry, just to tease this out a little bit for a moment, we had a recent a situation where we had two papers, one, one both declared an interest, one left, but one um, was able to answer questions related to the paper. And th I'm presuming that's different to participating in the discussion. I would read that as being able to ask questions. Ask questions. Answer is yeah. probably different because they can provide information that maybe somebody else could not. And is there a view about the appropriateness of that? I mean, it seemed helpful at the time. Uh, um, but is there any guidance around how that should be managed? 
well, I think that being able to answer questions is likely helpful. Um, but it, yeah, none of the rest of that should be. It, it's it's self-governed. You know, you've got to manage it and declare it yourself. And it states that you should be leaving the table. Okay, thank you. Councillor Ward. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just two questions from me. One would be, is declaring an interest common practice across the local government sector? Is that something that most councils do where councils can declare an interest but not a conflict? Or is that something that's more unique to us? I would assume that it would be something that is common practice, but I don't know that for certain. Hannah might have a bit more of a stare on that, perhaps. Through you, Mr. Mayor. Through you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, to answer the specific question, I can't give you an answer to that with clarity. However, I can give you a bit more context, and that is how different councils reflect their interests is quite varied. So some of them, obviously, we all now need to put them on the website as a part of that new amendment act, but some councils list councillors' declared interests in the agendas. Uh, some councils, the chair has a list of the elected members declared interests at the chair with them. Uh, not all councils have an item on their agenda every week like we do, which allows you to declare an interest according to the ad agenda papers because you may have an interest that you hadn't declared under the annual. Um, so we have that weekly, but not all councils do that. So there is a variety of practice if that helps give context. All right, thank you. Um, my other question was so. I feel like I'm very clear on what a conflict of interest is. Through our training, we get trained on what a conflict of interest is. It's in our standing orders. It's in our, um, you know, you know there's a, in our um, code of conduct. I guess my question is, what training as a new elected member can we offer to explain what an interest is from the outset? With the context being, for me, I came in and somebody declared an interest, and I had no idea what that was or that that was a thing you could do. You know, do we have any training on that we could provide? Well, the next three years could be feedback that we take on board for sure mm. um and you know like i said before you you're here because you're involved in the community so you've got a lot of interests and and that isn't something that we want to prevent of course mm. all right thank you thank you mr mayor uh councillor zabellum thank you mr mayor thanks desiree um so officers not recommending any changes to standing orders at the stage for this i'm just given the subjective Ish nature of self identification, but also perceptions of bias. Mm. In your view, is our process sufficiently robust? And that's why we wouldn't suggest any changes at this time? Or is it perhaps because it's very difficult to drill down further and get more concrete things? And that's why we might not make any changes? Any comments there? Probably a bit of both. Um, it would be difficult, I think, to put concrete guidance in there for you because it is heavily dependent on the situation. Cool. Thank you very much. Thank you, Okay, you're out of the queue. Right. Thank you, Desiree. So we've got a recommendation there that council received a memo titled "Definition and Application of Interests and Conflicts of Interest for Consideration," presented to council on 1 November 23. Happy to move that. Second by the deputy mayor. Any commentary? There being none, we will vote. And that has passed 15 votes, four none against. Thank you. All right, moving through to number 16, which is annual meeting calendar 2024, and page 47 um, from uh, Hannah, our governance manager. So, we'll wait for Hannah to. Happy right, to take Hannah. it as read, Mr. Mayor. Happy to answer any questions. Taken as read. Okay. Councillor Hapita. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Hannah. Um, okay. I'm pretty much happy with the way the calendar is for next year. My question is around um, 
the way in which meetings are run in, say, for example, the economic growth meeting, which met last week and had to move five items off its agenda from last week to this week because we started the meeting at nine o'clock and had to finish it by 12 o'clock because other things were scheduled for that day. Another meeting was scheduled at 12 and then another visit was scheduled at two o'clock. How can this calendar stop those things happening going forward? Thank you for your question, Councillor. Uh, I'm not sure the calendar can, but I, I think that elected members as a group can come to some conclusions about how they want to spend their time on Wednesdays uh, and how you would like to prioritise that space. Um, there is a lot of business to get through and elected members have committed to giving their full Wednesday and we are trying to schedule a lot of different types of business in that time. Uh, so, yeah, it, it's an ongoing challenge for us. So the Economic Development Committee should have probably gone to four o'clock and yet we had other things scheduled. Can we do it so that we don't have a finish date on a committee meeting? Is it my question? I think, do you mean a finishing time? Finishing like, time, sorry. Yes, so generally what we do, generally as a rule what we're doing is where a committee starts, it, it finishes at the point that the business is finished or there's a decision by the chair to adjourn the, the, uh, the business to another time. Uh, I think that that week was an exception to that rule where we didn't expect that there would have been such a large agenda and thus we had decided that something else could go in there and then when it came to it, there was more business than expected. Are we saying this is foolproof going forward? No, it's not foolproof. Do we have to schedule workshops and other visits to other places on other days of the week? Uh, is it, asking your advice. Yeah. It is really difficult to schedule all of the business of councillors into one day of the week. So your advice is yes, we do. It would certainly be preference <laughs> for me uh, to make magic happen. <laughs> it would be easier to have more time to do that. But obviously, elected members have a lot of a lot of other things that they need to balance as well. It's not a full time job for you. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Councillor Naila. Um, thank you. Um, I'm, it looks really good to me too. But uh, my question is was just similar to Leonie's, Councillor Harper's, and um, and particular with the risk and assurance start time of one o'clock was there any consideration because four of those meetings there are morning committees um, that would then supposedly need to fit from nine to twelve was there any consideration of putting their time as a two o'clock start like what was above there in the Rangatane or Manawa two committee? I did consider that uh, the, the request came from some of the members of Rangitane to make it a two o'clock so that they could meet their other commitments on Wednesdays. Um, on the other hand, the opposite of that for um, the appointed member that chairs that committee is that he would like as long as possible for his business. So that then gives him four hours. So it actually allows for a longer afternoon meeting. So it was, yes, it was considered and done on purpose. Okay, and so the four four committees that are on the mornings of those meetings, would you think that it was reasonable to fit those in within the three hours? I'm hoping that I've been I've thought carefully about which committees we do that, and those chairs are aware of that at this point, even before we start the year. Okay, mm. thank you. And just the only other quick question was the risk and assurance um, meetings in September, October, November. Is that additional one, and for the purposes of the annual? in your report yes um okay that makes sense thank you just one um in march there hannah we got council on the 6th also got risk and assurance at 1 p.m on the 6th do you think we're gonna pretty well like uh, council harper that's coming are we going to be doing a june start june start june I'm trying to think back at all the pieces of the puzzle that we put together to make this happen. And oh, at the top of my head right now, Mr. Mayor, is that the February the 14th council meeting is the key one because that's where we're hoping that you'll be able to look at your consultation document for audit. And then the next key council meeting is the 3rd of April. 
but that the 6th of March is not expected to be such a large agenda. OK, all right, take that on board. Thank you. Councillor Wood. Oh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just to ask you a question, is there a particular reason why the day has to finish at 5 p.m.? Or if we're having two committee meetings in a day, could a committee meeting, if we were having a second one, be scheduled as practice to start at 3 or 4 p.m. and run later into the day so that we avoid situations we've been dealing with constantly this year where workshops or other activities get pushed off because meetings run over time? Like, is there a, I know other councils meet later in the day. Yeah, they do. If I can answer that, they don't start at nine, though. Um, it makes, I mean, I, you know, I, as the chair, it makes a heck of a long day yep. to be here from nine till five. And then, and we've done it occasionally with a long term plan, and we've finished at seven and a bit later. You're a bit of a zombie. It's a bit of a risk even driving home. Um, so, my comment will, would be that um, I, don't, I don't know if it's really conducive to good decision making. OK, fair enough. We've just got to manage some of these things, to be really honest. It's, and if we do adjourn, and it's not ideal, but just it is what it is. Councillor Barn. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Hannah, delighted to see that school holidays have made an appearance back in the calendar. Um, new elected members won't be aware because we didn't do that this year. But would you comment, please, on why we take a week for school holidays um, for Easter and October? Uh, few, through you, Mr. Mayor, uh, a few years ago, uh, the request came from elected members that we consider uh, not having a meeting in one of the two weeks of the school holidays in, um, in between term one and term two and in between term three and term four. Uh, to um, enable, at the time the request was to enable elected members who had school aged children to be able to uh, complete their duties with their families as well as to the council table. Uh, and we weren't able to schedule that this year simply because we were trying to uh, include sufficient numbers of meetings of each of the committees across the year having um, started later into the year following the election and the setup of the new committee structure. And so in order to do that, we didn't have that availability of those extra two weeks. Um, so the intention was always that that would be reinstated in this year's calendar. Uh, and I think that well, from observations in the last set of school holidays that we've just been through, there was a significant number of staff taking annual leave over that same period. And we, you would have noticed you were sometimes getting the three IC at the microphone. So um, it is something that we need to probably weigh up again going forward. Yeah. Councillor Naylor. Sorry, just to the Mayor's point um, about the March the 6th council meeting, if we have got risk and assurance in the afternoon, I was also wondering, do we? Can, did you? Uh, is there a consideration of fitting in the councillor-only session that we normally have on a council day? Um, and I mean, w it was there a reason why risk and assurance wouldn't be put perhaps on the thirteenth? Uh, sorry, because I haven't got everything in front of me, but it was more about make so. Uh, sustainability from memory off the top of my head has another date that it's coupled with risk and assurance. So it was about making sure and being fair to all the chairs that everyone took a share of when the balance would sit with having a half day. Uh, as for councillor only, yes, as a rule, uh, the councillors gather for a session together uh, where possible on a council day. And I have not heard from the mayor that he intends anything otherwise. Oh, okay, so would that not just not be fitted in that month. Oh, well, we'll potentially that one month of the year it might it, not happen. It, it's it is, February and March have both yep. got that issue, so that's why I asked the question. Um, I just thought it was perhaps something to think about when to fit it in, so that it doesn't go months, you know, three or three or four months without. All right, there's no more questions. Thank you. Okay, we have the recommendation to council that we adopt the annual meeting calendar 2024, attachment one. I'm happy to move it. Seconded by the Deputy Mayor. No comments. We will vote. It's 
Passed 15 votes for, none against, thank you. Right, we'll move through to um, our next item, which is number 17, and that's around our council work schedule. Um, and that's on page 51, in the CE, through to 55, is quite a bit there. So, are there any questions of Officers of that. There being none. All right. OK, I'm quite happy to move this. That we recommend. To Council that uh, we receive the work schedule dated November 23. Uh, happy to move, seconded by the Deputy Mayor. There being no comments, we'll vote. That is passed 15 votes for, none against. Moving through to number 18 and 19, and I'll ask the Chair of uh, the Economic Growth Committee to speak to those recommendations. Page 57 and 61 of your Council papers. And the additional papers that we received this morning. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, I'd like to move um, that we receive um, no, so that we move the recommendations that are on your papers on page 18, which, um, sorry, page 57 of our papers, and also on the night that was on the 9th of October, and also on page 61 of our papers, which is on the 25th of October, and also the tabled item, which was recommendations 44 and 46, which were missed off the recommendations from, moment, from the meeting of the 9th of October. I'd like to move that and second it by. Seconded by the Council. Deputy Chair, Councillor Wood. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, matters arising, Councillor Johnson. I'd just ask if we could have uh, item 19, which is the committee recommendation on the 1st of November, separately, please. Sorry, which one is that again? 59. Right, yes, got you, got you, thank you. Understood, all right. Okay, so we're going to do all of the ninths first. And then we'll do the the 25th separately. And before we go there, other matters arising, Councillor Naylor. Um, just a quick question on item 19. The second recommendation that was passed at the committee um, regarding getting a policy for a CPI increase, did that not need to come to Council for endorsement? Was that, is, is that under delegation of, for, from the committee? So it was around the chief executive bringing back a paper back to us to fully endorse. Oh, a paper wasn't asked for. We just we just asked the chief executive to develop a policy. We're just just double checking what what it is around the policy if it needs to be written under the policy. So what we might do is we'll vote on the first part. Then we'll come back to number So we're voting now just on the 9th of October. Thank you. Uh, 
I just pass 13 votes for one, um, one abstention. We're just um, just finding out the minutes of that meeting. Just get that explained why it isn't there. Uh, Councillor Noah, through you, Mr Mayor. Uh, so the resolution that was being questioned was was resolved under delegation of the committee because it was referring work to the chief executive to bring that CPI increase into a policy. So the policy would then come back through committee and back to council for approval. So that's why it didn't need to be confirmed by council today. OK, we got through that one. So we will now look to uh, vote on item 19 in front of you, thanks. And that is passed. 11 votes uh, for and four against. OK. We're now moving through to uh, recommendations from the uh, Rangitane or Manawatu Committee. And uh, as Chair, uh, I'd like to uh, recommend to Council uh, the three items there around uh, Council hold the Rangitane or Manawatu Environmental Management Plan as a Council record uh, under the Resource Management Act 1991, and that Council use the Rangitani or Manawatu Environmental Management Plan to inform future planning, decision making um, as directed by the Act, and the new Spatial Planning Act and new Natural and Built Environment Act. And that Council use the Rangitani or Manawatu Environmental Management Plan to inform the review of direction setting documents such as the long term plan and Council Supporting Strategies, Plans, Policy, Bylaws, Master Plans and Frameworks. I'm happy to move that, seconded by the Deputy Mayor. If there's no discussion to that, we or in matters arising, we will vote, please. And that has passed 13 votes for and two abstentions. Thank you. All right, we will now uh, go to we'll now go to uh, part two or excluding the public. Um, and the reasons stated on pages six and seven of the agenda papers. And I'll I'll read. I will read them out. Um, 
So there's third party commercial. There is uh, reasons for third party commercial. Uh, there is commercial activities around uh, information needing to be kept confidential to allow council to engage in uh, commercial activities without prejudice or disadvantage. There's uh, negotiations. Uh, there's the privacy of individuals and private and personal information to be confidential on a number of occasions around uh, committee and uh, trustee appointments. And again, privacy around uh, the part uh, 2B um, and the uh, CE's uh, uh, performance review. So um, I'm happy to move those um, that we move into part two. Seconded by the Deputy Mayor. If there's no, oh, here we go, Councillor Johnson. I had, <clears throat> excuse me, just a quick question, Mr Mayor. Um, I'm just wondering if the explanations for why these items are in part two now meet the recommendations um, of the <laughs> of the report uh, that was uh, produced recently from the Auditor General. Uh, from the Ombudsman. Om the Ombudsman, sorry. I believe so. Through you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, we are on the way, will be the answer. Uh, so, what the Ombudsman's report has requested of all councils across the country is that we work on using plain English to explain to the public in plain English why a particular piece of work is being recommended to be taken in confidential session. So what you will have noticed, we've actually already changed some of the language around the description rather than just, we used to just quote the section from the legislation, but we've we've um, put more words in there. That's only the first step. What the Ombudsman is, is um, requesting that we consider doing is look at how we can speak to the specific harm that we have weighed up against the public interest and to specifically refer to that at this point in the meeting. Now, what we've done uh, is go back to the office and suggest what we think are good ways of doing plain English and ask for their advice before we then take the step to work with officers about how we can describe with enough specificity for the public without actually making the harm public. Uh, so we're just working through that process at the moment. So would that be an additional column then? You know, so we'd have the item, the reason, the part of the act and then the harm? Yes. Okay. So we can expect that coming shortly, can we? We're working on it at the moment. We're waiting on the office to give feedback on what we've given to them. Thank you. OK. All right, we will vote, please. Has passed 15 votes for and none against. Right, we'll just a couple of minutes as we move into part two. So stretch your legs.